I've been looking for a public relations person, and I think I just found her. <laughs> We're not hooked up. Here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, thank you very much, uh, Joy, for those nice uh, words. Uh, I, I do need a publicity person, and that would uh, be very helpful to have somebody like her. Uh, I grew up uh, in southern Illinois near uh, Crawford County, where Jones uh, lived. Uh, I, my first memories are of World War II veterans. I grew up with neighbors who saw the attack on Ford Island uh, as the Japanese uh, planes came in uh, the pass uh, to hit uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, my cousin had landed on Omaha Beach, was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I knew a man who saw the flag raising on Iwo Jima. So World War II has been in my head uh, ever since I can remember. And then in 1951, uh, Jones's novel, uh, From Here to Eternity, came out. It took me a long time to read it. My family, my parents didn't think the 11, 10, 11 year old boy should be reading that kind of uh, book. But uh, I finally sneaked it out and, and got it read by the time I was about, before the movie came out. At any rate, uh, I've always been interested in, in Jones's concept of the evolution of the soldier. So I sort of combined this, the evolution of soldier and the writer. And I got, took it from the last paragraph of Jones's 1975 World War II, uh, a nonfiction soldier's view of the war, that he wrote about the end of the war and the transformation that takes place in those who fight our wars. It was a process that he called uh, the evolution and de-evolution of a soldier. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, was with the 7th Marines when they rolled into Baghdad uh, uh, three or four years ago. And he said he was sitting talking to the battalion commander uh, one day, and he said, you know, I'm, just, I'm scared all the time. He said, you know, what? And, and the colonel looked at him and said, you know, you haven't accepted the fact that you're already dead uh, yet, which is the concept that Jones talks about in the evolution of the soldier. Uh, and from World War II, how many times had they heard the long the old, long, drawn-out, faint command passed down the long length of parade, vast parade grounds fading as the guidons moved out front. So slowly it faded, leaving behind it a whole generation of men who would walk into history looking backwards, with their backs to the suns, peering forever over their shoulders behind them at their own lengthening shadows trailing across the earth. None of them would ever really get over it. And I, I think that's true, regardless of how people internalized it, uh, some of them internalized it uh, much differently and went on with their life, and a lot of people didn't. They turned to alcohol, they turned to suicide. My cousin committed suicide on the anniversary of D-Day. I don't think he ever got over it. I don't think James Jones ever really got over the war. Yet he was able to write about it uh, in a way that was uniquely frank, real, and from the point of view of the ordinary enlisted man that he had been, leaving behind a body of uh, work on World War II that's unparalleled. <clears throat> Even before leaving the Army in 1944, he was writing about war and his own experiences in letters to his brother Jeff and in college class essays while he was still in Hawaii and stationed at Schofield Barracks. He was also thinking about his life as a writer then. He wrote about Henry Fleming, the young Civil War soldier in Stephen Cranes's Red Badge of Courage, and how he was handling his first combat experience, comparing what Fleming and how Fleming uh, talked about his own experience uh, and relating that to his own during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it was at the Post Library where he was reading Thomas Wolfe that he later wrote that, it, he had, that he knew he had, quote, been a writer all along without having realized it. Now that writer was an Illinois boy, born into a well-to-do family in Robinson in 1921. His father was a dentist who lost much of his practice in social and economic standing during the Great Depression and drank heavily. He later committed suicide while Jones was in the Army, and his mother had died of congestive heart failure just a couple of years before that. It was the same heart problem that uh, James Jones uh, uh, died of in 1977. Not much in his early life indicated that Jones uh, would become an internationally famous writer, and maybe there's nothing in our, our early lives that indicates what we're going to do uh, later, but there was certainly nothing in, in Jones's. He was a loner. He did like to read, but didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And after he graduated for school because they didn't have money to, to go to college, he enlisted in the regular army because, like a lot of uh, young men of the time, he had few other options. So he spent five years 
soldiering and essentially preparing for his life as a writer. Frank Marshall, a member of uh, Jones's company at Schofield Barracks, upon whom the character Friday is based in From Here to Eternity, says it was in those days that Jones would sit at a desk, sit at a desk in the orderly room and type away at some piece of writing under a sign that said, quote, genius at work. Uh, now, I think one of these men in here is uh, Frank Marshall. I think it's this man uh, right back here. I'm not uh, positive of that. I think I'm also uh, fairly positive that this man uh, uh, in the middle here is Robert Stewart, who is the character that uh, uh, Pruitt is based on. But not long after, words, the genius had the material dumped in his lap that made it possible for him to become the only person who witnessed the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor to go on to write about it and become a well-known writer, novelist because of it. Now, John Sheroda, uh, one of the last members of the colony, uh, did write a book called Lucky Come Hawaii uh, that was about the attack on Pearl Harbor from the Japanese uh, uh, immigrant uh, perspective. And the only other writer that was there, I heard somebody last night mention Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs was there on December the 7th, 1941. He was playing tennis that morning. As far as I know, never did write anything about it. And when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941, it was a typical Sunday morning for the soldiers stationed at Schofield. A Sunday morning after a night of hard drinking, fighting, and making the rounds of the whorehouses. A routine weekend for many soldiers. Some of the men were eating morning chow when a, a blast rocked the mess hall in a scene that was later, sh later showed up in From Here to Eternity. Quote, must be doing some dynamiting down to Wheeler Field, somebody said tentatively. This is it, somebody said quite simply. Warden found his eyes and Starks were looking to each other. There was nothing on Starks' eye face except the slack, relaxed, relaxed, peaceful look of drunkenness, and Warden felt there must not be anything on his either. He pulled his mouth up and showed his teeth in a grin, and Stark's face pulled his mouth in an identical grin. Down the street, over the trees, a big column of black smoke was mushrooming up into the sky. The men behind were crowding out the door. So now the evolution of the soldier uh, here begins in earnest. They had been training for that uh, uh, at this point, but it begins in earnest now. And Jones's, Jones's eyes were very good. Uh, <clears throat> His mind was clear, and you could really start feeling the point of his writing uh, at this point and from here to eternity. And for those, most of the next 150 pages of eternity, you see how the Japanese attack must have looked and felt to those people who were there. And I've talked to the man in Oblong uh, that uh, saw the attack on Pearl Harbor, the only one that I really talked to at length, and he, explained, he uh, describes a lot of the same things that Jones uh, writes about in From Here to Eternity. You see the grinning, waving Japanese pilot that uh, Jones actually saw strafing the barracks, the beginning of a war, and the birth of a new era for the United States. And you see this just as clearly as you see the excitement of Warden and Stark <clears throat> about the prospect of going to war, like young men about to have their first sexual experience. <clears throat> From Here to Eternity may not have been Jones's best crafted book, as he maintained it wasn't, but there's little doubt that it's one of the best eyewitness counts of the peacetime pre-war World War II American army on the brink of being thrust into war, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and the resulting uncertainty of the future for the people everywhere that you're ever likely to read. In that respect, it was Jones at his best, and he won the National Book Award for it in 1952. That Sunday morning in 1941 changed many people's lives forever, and the war that followed gave James Jones that barrage of raw material from which he drew up on <clears throat> in his writing right up until his death when he was four chapters short of completing Whistle, the last novel in his noted World War II trilogy that included From Here to Eternity in the Thin Red Line, and which he started when he came home from the war. He dictated those last chapters of Whistle into a tape recorder from his Long Island hospital bed for his trusted friend Willie Morris to finish. 